Thank you, Tony. Well, today we're going to go back to the throne room of God. We were there last Sabbath. Last Sabbath we looked at Revelation chapter 4. And we saw some things in the throne room of God described there in Revelation chapter 4. For example, God the Father was there on the throne. And he had an emerald green rainbow around the throne. We talked a little bit about that. And there in the throne room of God that John was called to come to, um, the Holy Spirit was there. Heavenly angels were there. And 24 redeemed people from planet Earth were there. The 24 elders were there. But there was someone not described in Revelation chapter 4 at the throne room of God. Some then, someone that you would, would think, well, I wonder why he wasn't mentioned there. And that's Jesus. And the reason Jesus wasn't mentioned in Revelation chapter 4 is because chapter 5 is simply a continuation of Revelation chapter 4. And Jesus is the focal point of Revelation chapter 5. Jesus described there as the Lamb before the throne of God, the title of today's sermon. But before we get into Revelation uh, chapter 5 today, I want to start with this verse from Romans chapter 8 and verse 32. It says, He who did not spare his own son, God the Father did not spare his own son. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish. God did not spare his own son. Delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him, how shall God not with Jesus also freely give us all things? And so the, if Jesus is the focal point of Revelation chapter 5, this, this verse simply reminds you of just how important Jesus is. Because if you have Jesus, along with him comes everything else. Along with Jesus comes all things. It's kind of like when I married Angie. And when I married Angie, I, I got a grandma, came along with her. My other grandparents were dead and gone, and so I got a grandma. I got two sisters when I married Angie. They came along with her, too. I grew up with four brothers. I never had a sister before until I married Angie, and they came along with her. I, I got a, a car when I married Angie. It wasn't much of a car, Tony. It was an old Chevy Chevette, <laughs> but it ran good, and it, it got pretty good gas mileage, old four-cylinder Chevy Chevette, but I got a car. I got a beautiful Scottish, black and white Scottish collie dog named Tasha when I married Angie. Um, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It goes on from there. That's why Jesus, the focal point of Revelation chapter 5, the Lamb of God, the Lamb before the throne of God, is so important for us to take a look at today. And so when we go to Revelation chapter 5, verse 1, I saw, in the I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne. This is God the Father. And John sees hold him holding in his hand a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. So the scroll that God is holding, no one can open. No one can read. And if it's sealed, you can't read it. You can't understand what's contained within the scroll. And Revelation 5, 2, and 3 goes on, Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. Now notice it says it's a strong angel who asks the question. So this this scroll that has seven seals, it's not an issue of who's strong enough to open the scroll. It's not a question of strength. It was a strong angel who asked the question. It's an issue of worthiness. Who is worthy to open the scroll? And there's no one, there's, there's no one in all of heaven, there's no one in all of earth, there's no one in anywhere in the universe to be found except for one Who's worthy? Now, in the same context here at the throne of God, it gives us two clues as to who it is that's worthy. Two clues that we can know without a doubt who it is that's able to take this scroll and open it and to, and to interpret it and teach it. Let's look at those two clues found here at the throne of God. 
the last verse of Revelation chapter 4, the throne room of God, it says, you are worthy. Here's the first worthy. And remember, the only, there's, there's no one worthy to open a scroll except for this totally unique being. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. Who is it? For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. The creator. There's only one being in all the universe who created everything. The one who is the creator is the one who is worthy. And then Revelation 5 verse 9. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. Who is it that's worthy? The creator. For you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. Creator and Redeemer, the only one who's worthy to, take, to go to God the Father on the throne and to take the scroll and to open it up is Jesus Christ and Him alone, the Lamb who's here in Revelation chapter 5, the Lamb before the throne. I came across something the other day that I thought was interesting on, the, on how unique Jesus is. We know He's totally unique. He is the only Creator of everything. He is the... Uh, the, the only one who's the Redeemer. But he was totally unique. He began his ministry by being hungry, and yet Scripture says he's the bread of life. He ended his ministry on earth by being thirsty, but yet he is the water of life, the source of the water of life. He was weary, he got tired, but yet he is our rest. Come unto me, if any of you are, are weary and tired, I will give you rest, and yet he himself was weary. He paid tribute, he paid the taxes, but yet at the same time he is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus was accused of having a demon, and yet he's the one who cast demons out. Jesus wept, and yet he wipes away our tears. He was sold for 30 pieces of silver, and yet he paid the infinite price to buy the world, to redeem the world. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and yet Jesus is the good shepherd. He died, and yet by his death, he destroyed the power of death. He's the only one totally unique. He's the only one able to take the scroll, the creator, the redeemer, the total uniqueness of heaven, which tells us that there's no one. If Jesus is the only one who can... Take the scroll, open the scroll. He's the only one then who's able to teach us what's in the scroll. Have you ever thought of that? Have you ever thought of that, that if you've learned anything from the Bible, you learned it from Jesus. You learned it from God himself. Luke 24, look what it says here, Jesus teaching his disciples. Beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them all the scriptures, took the scriptures and taught his disciples the things concerning himself, and he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. The same applies to his disciples today. Now, when Jesus left the disciples, he said, I'm going to send one that will be with you. He's just like me. And Jesus called him the Comforter. It's the Holy Spirit. Jesus, the Son of God, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, Look what it says, John 16. However, when He, the Comforter, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of truth has come, He will guide you into all truth. He will tell you things to come. It's divinity that opens the scroll. Jesus that teaches us the scroll so that we can understand its context and how it applies to our lives. That's why Revelation 1.3 says, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear, study and understand, read and hear. The words of this prophecy, and keep, live by, do, keep those things which are written in it. The reason I bring this up, well, obviously Jesus is the only one that can take the scroll, the only one that can open the scroll. He's the only one that can teach us the scroll is because we have to be careful not to just accept what somebody tells us about the one who is worthy without realizing we've got to get it from the one who is worthy for ourselves. There's a big difference between hearing what someone tells me about Jesus and me going to Jesus for myself and getting it from Him on a personal level. i got to believe that there's something to this warning as to why it is that one-third of the heavenly angels were deceived in heaven. One third of the heavenly angels were deceived in heaven, and I'm sure there are many reasons why, but I'm sure one reason is that the angels looked at this 
beautiful, high-ranking angel, Lucifer, that stood right next to the throne of God, and they accepted what Lucifer said because Lucifer is a good angel. He's a good guy. We respect him. He's nice. I know him. He, and they just simply must have had an element of, I'm going to accept what Lucifer tells me. He's not going to steer me wrong. It's got to be true. It can't be, it can't be something that's, that's not true. And they ended up believing what Lucifer told them. It's the same today. Lucifer is the master deceiver, and he's going to deceive the world in the last days, except for those who live by one principle. Thus saith the Lord. It's not so much what someone else says. It's a thus saith the Lord to me and to you on a personal basis. Oh, it's okay to, to hear what people say about Jesus, but then I've got to go to Jesus for myself, and I've got to get it from him. And then I'm following Jesus. I'm not following what somebody else told me about Jesus. I don't know how many times I've had people tell me, well, so-and-so said this, and I'm going to believe that. Come on, you've got to go by what Jesus tells you. What, is, what does he teach you from the Bible? Follow Jesus. No, but so-and-so won't lead me astray. My church says this, and so I'm going to go by that. Come on. That's, that's part of the deception in the last days. Jesus is the only one who can open the scroll. He's the only one that can teach us the scroll. And if we let, let anyone else or any other organization take that position, we're on dangerous ground in the last days of earth's history. Have you ever heard this story? The issue between Aristotle and Galileo. Aristotle lived in 300 B.C., but Aristotle was considered the smartest man in the world in his time. And so his reputation continued on even long after he was dead. Aristotle, the world's greatest thinker, greatest mind. But Aristotle taught something. He taught that if you take a heavy weighted object and a lighter weighted object and you took them to a high point and you drop them both at the same time, Aristotle taught that the heavier weighted object would hit the ground first because it was heavier. And, and so it just stands to reason that it would hit the ground first before the lighter weighted object. Until Galileo comes along, almost 2,000 years later, in the 1500s, Galileo comes along and he is figuring out the principle of gravity. And he demonstrated that if you take a heavy weighted object and a lighter weight. He took a 10 pound weight and a one pound weight, supposedly as the story goes, up to the top of the leaning tower of Pisa. So he could drop them both at the same time. And he had the thought, the thought leaders of the day there to observe his premise that they're going to hit the ground at the same time because gravity pulls objects to the ground at the same rate of speed. And so the heavier object and the lighter object, he drops them and they hit the ground at the same time. But guess what the thought leaders of the day, who always believed what Aristotle had taught for 2,000 years, they had believed this, the thought leaders of the day, even though they saw what, Aris, what, what Galileo had demonstrated, they did not believe Galileo's premise. And they rejected it. Because Aristotle was a smart guy. He would not lead us astray. Listen, we can't go by what a pastor says or what somebody on TV says or what the, a, a, an esteemed person who may be the head of the, the general conference may say. We've got to realize this principle of Jesus is the only one in the universe that can take the scroll out of the hand of God, open it, and give us understanding of it is Jesus himself, the importance of our personal relationship with Jesus, the Lamb before the throne of God. Revelation 5, verse 4, it says, So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. This scroll that Jesus takes out of the hand of God the Father is of such great importance that it's actually a matter of life and death. How do we know that this scroll is a matter of life and death? Well, first of all, it says, John wept much. It was a matter of life and death because of the effect that it had on John. As John stands there and he realizes, oh, I, can't, I don't know what's in that scroll, I know it's important. John felt hopeless. John felt lost. And he felt that the whole world was lost. The whole world was hopeless because no one is worthy to open, to get that scroll and to open it. 
It was a matter of life and death. And so that's the effect that it had on John. And that part two as to why we know it was a matter of life and death is because of the words of the 24 elders who come to encourage John. And the word of the 24 elder is this in verse 9. They knew someone who was worthy. They come to John and they say, don't, don't weep, John. I know someone who's worthy. It's okay. And he says, you, the one, he says, you were slain and have redeemed us. The one who's worthy, he saved us, John. He's, he's redeemed us. He died in our place. He died so that we don't have to. He died so that we can have hope. So this scroll is of such great importance. John felt lost. He felt hopeless until he was reminded by one of the 24 elders there is someone who's worthy. It's the same one who died for our sins and redeemed us and gives us hope. You know, when you think of this, of all the beings who are there at the throne of God that day, God the Father is there, the Holy Spirit is there, the angels are there, that even angels that excel in strength, of all the beings who could have gone to John, who's standing there at the throne of God, feeling lost, feeling discouraged, the, the cloud of doom and gloom has come and surrounded his mind. Of all the beings that were there, and in my mind, I kind of envision it like this, that perhaps one of the heavenly angels, you know, the heavenly angels are ministering spirits sent forth to us who are the heirs of salvation. I can imagine one of the angels starting to make the movement to, to go to John to minister to him in his time of doom and gloom and weeping, weeping much. And I can imagine God the Father putting his hand out and, you know, stopping him. No. And then one of the 24 elders looks at God the Father on the throne. There's John weeping. And God the Father looks at one of the 24 elders and, nods his head, yeah. That's just me playing this out in my mind. Of all the beings who were there at the throne of God, one of the 24 elders goes to John. One of the 24 elders puts his arm around John. It's one of the 24 elders who comes and shares with John from his own personal experience. John, I know how you feel. I felt that way too. When I was on earth, I, I know exactly what it feels like, John. I know what it, how it feels when the cloud of doom and gloom comes around, and I know how it feels when you feel hopeless and lost. But, John, I found there's an answer. I found there's one who's worthy. The power of a personal testimony from among a fellow human being. John, there is one who's worthy. And he comes and he gives encouragement to John, reminding John of the good news of the gospel. Reminding John, the disciple that Jesus loved. John, the beloved disciple who, who knew Jesus. He had lived for Jesus for at least the last 60 years of his life. Needed to be reminded of Jesus. Needed to be reminded of the gospel. Needed to be reminded of the good news. John, in his old age, listen, if John could be at the throne of God and feel discouraged, and feel hopeless, and feel lost. John, who knew Jesus for more than 60 years, how many of us today can come to church feeling hopeless, and with the cloud of doom and gloom around our head, and feeling lost in the presence of the church? The point is simple. We all need to be reminded of the good news of the gospel. We all need to be reminded of the goodness of Jesus Christ. We all struggle at times with our personal feelings that get us down. And even John the disciple at the throne of God had to have a fellow human being come and put their arm around John and point them, point John to Jesus. I thought, wow, thank you for that encouragement for me, God, because I know how I feel when I get that way. And even John the disciple felt that way too. So this, this issue of the scroll being sealed, it says that, that, that uh, the elder, the, one of the 24 elders that came to John, this is what he said to John. One of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, look, look right there. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. Don't you like that? I can just imagine he had his arm around his shoulder. Don't, don't cry anymore, John. It's going to be all right. Look. Look at Jesus. He's right there. 
If John can feel that way, how, how many of us feel that way? Oh, yeah, but man, Tony, you've known the Lord for years, and you know the story of the gospel. What do I need to encourage Tony? We all do. We're all in the same boat along with John the, describe, the disciple. Something else about this scroll is that it points out how needy we, are, we all are. We are all needy. None of us are worthy. None of us are able to, to take the scroll. It reminds me how needy I am. And when I remember how needy I am, then it helps me to remember how needy you are. If I remember how needy I am, it makes me feel humble. And it helps me to remember how needy you are. It makes me be able to take you with a grain of salt. You know what I mean by that? And if you remember how needy you are, it'll help you to be humble and it will help you to remember how needy I am so that you can take me with a grain of salt as well. And it helps in the way we get along with one another. And then it reminds me too, this, this sealed scroll that only Jesus can meet my need. And if he's the only one that can meet my need, he's the only one that can meet your need too. The importance of the sealed scroll. And then the, 20, the, the elder said to John, Jesus has prevailed. It's in the past tense. He has prevailed. We have been redeemed. Now, whoever these 24 elders are, they're redeemed human beings. We talked about that last week, and we saw that in Revelation chapter 4. Um, it doesn't tell us who they are, which implies... There's, you don't know their names. They're, they're not, their names aren't given in Scripture. You don't know who they are. They're not anyone famous and recorded in Scripture, but they're 24 redeemed human beings at the throne of God. Um, so they had to have lived... Well, the only people that we know in heaven, according to the Bible, there's Enoch who walked with God and he was taken. He was gone. There was Elijah who was caught up in a fiery chariot, translated, taken to heaven. There was Moses who died and... And then Jesus especially took him, resurrected him early, took him to heaven. And then there was a group of people who were raised at the resurrection of Jesus. When Jesus died and rose from the tomb, there was the first fruits that went to heaven with Jesus. Remember them described in, in Matthew? They must have been among that group of the first fruits resurrected when Jesus was resurrected and went to heaven. That's the only, only reference of the reference in Scripture as to who these 24 people before the throne of God could have been. But they come to Jesus and they refer, as they're trying to encourage John, they're, they're speaking in the past tense. That's what I wanted to get to. They say in, in past tense, John, he has prevailed. John, we have been redeemed. Now, if this is a person died before the cross, but they're... the children of God, and they were specially resurrected to go to Jesus among, among the first fruits, they're saying to John something like this, John, I know how you feel. I mean, I had my doubts too. I had my struggles. I felt lost at times too, John. But, and I had questions, and I had doubts, and things I didn't understand, like a sealed scroll, the things that happened in my life that I didn't understand, John, but, but I continued to trust in Jesus and John, I'm here now on the other side. And I'm looking back now. John, it'll work out. John, hang in there. John, don't give up. John, you may have questions. You may have doubts. You may have fears. But Jesus has prevailed. And I'm living proof of that. I'm here on this side now, looking back, John. Because if I'm here, you'll be here too. Continue to trust in Jesus. That past tense of them looking from, the other, from that vantage point, that perspective, looking back and saying to John, John, if I've made it and I'm here, John, keep trusting Jesus. You will make it too. The past tenseness, they can see more clearly than what John could see. And there are things in our lives today that we may not see as clearly as we would like to see, but the 24 elders on the other side can see more clearly because they're looking back and they're saying to us today, keep trusting in Jesus and someday you will see as clearly as what we see now. They can see so clearly now because they are on the other side and someday when we're on the other side too, we will look back and it'll make sense then if it's not making sense now. Seeing, being able to see more clearly than what we're able to see today. Then it goes on, Revelation 5, 6 through 10. I saw in the midst of the throne 
And in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as if it had been slain. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. When he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and twenty-four elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. They're involved in priestly ministry. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God. We shall reign on the earth. They were redeemed from every tribe, it says. Tribe, tongue, nation, people. We're going to look at two of these words here. First, we're going to look at the word tribe. What does it mean that they were redeemed from every tribe? Well, the old King James says they were redeemed from every kindred. Here's what the word is in the Greek. It's the Greek word laos, L-A-O-S. Laos. It means tribe. It means kindred. It means the people. People of God. Whoever these 24 elders were around the throne of God, they are people. And it's anyone and everyone who's been saved and redeemed by Jesus. Anyone and everyone who has had a relationship with Jesus. In other words, it is not just 24 Old Testament Jewish men who have been taken to heaven around the throne of God, serving in a priestly capacity. It's people, the people of God. And for example, Matthew 1, 21, the Laos, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his Laos, his people, from their sin. Man, woman, young, old, doesn't matter. Whoever the people of God are that that are saved and redeemed, Laos, they're at the throne of God. Here's another example, Laos. But you, Bethlehem, for out of you shall come a ruler who who will shepherd my Laos, shepherd my people, Israel. Whoever is a sheep of Jesus, the shepherd, you qualify to be among the 24 elders around the throne of God. It's the Laos, the people of God, from every tribe, every kindred, every people of God. Um, I just realized I'm getting, I'm getting tribe and people mixed up. I, I apologize for that. Tribe is the other word we're coming back to. We're, we're focusing now on, on Laos, the people. Tribe is what we're going to look at next, but... If Jesus is our shepherd, here's something I wanted to to bring up, something that was a revelation to me this this past week working on the sermon. As I was thinking about from every tribe, every tongue, every nation, every people, and that if this is people from all different cultures, all different groups, all different people that are saved by Jesus and qualify to be among the 24 elders around the throne of God, I thought to myself, okay, we're all the sheep. Jesus is our shepherd. We're the sheep. And I thought to myself, I wonder how many different colors of sheep there are. So I Googled it. How many different colors of sheep are there? And I found there are five. Let's see if I can remember them. There's white. There's black. There's brown. There's gray. And there's pink. Whoops. Pink is the word. Pink. Now, it said pink is a very small percentage-wise but there is a small percentage of sheep, five different colors of sheep. So I thought, okay, let me think, how many different colors of people are there? We're the sheep, Jesus is the shepherd, and so I began to think. We know the the children's song, red and yellow, black and white, all are precious in his sight. But then there's brown also, right? So I thought, okay, there's five. Five colors of sheep, five colors of people. Laos, the people of God, we all qualify to be able to be there. It's not just 24 Jewish men. But you are chosen generation. Another example of Laos. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Who's he talking to? He's talking to fellow Christians, members of the church, the body of Christ. You're a royal priesthood. You're a a holy nation, his own special people. Laos, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people but are now the Laos, the people of of God, the 24 elders around the throne of God say, we came here from every tribe, every nation, every tongue, every people. 
which implies there's a vast mixture of backgrounds of people from planet Earth that have already been saved and are already there at the throne of God. Here's the word that I got out of order here that we want to look at. It's the word tribe, okay? Now we're back to tribe. From every tribe, tongue, nation, and people. Tribe is the Greek word phule, and it means tribe, kindred, race. So now you can see how I misspoke earlier. Phule means race. People, 24 elders around the throne of God, the laos of God, redeemed from planet Earth, are from every multitude of race, of people. Not just a certain race, not just a certain color. It's a pe- not s- just a certain gender around the throne of God, the foule, which tells us something. If it's that way at the throne of God, shouldn't it be that way here on planet Earth for people that are the sheep of Jesus Christ, for people that are the followers of Jesus Christ? Our identity on earth is not based on my gender. My identity on earth is not based on my nationality. My identity on earth is not based on the color of my skin. The, our identity as Christians on planet Earth is based in Jesus. We are Christian. No matter if I'm African or American or Russian or Chinese, we are Christian. We identify with Christ. Not with my earthly race, but with my heavenly, my heavenly family, my heavenly kingdom that I'm a part of. And so that tells us there should be no no class system among Christians now. If there are no class systems among Christians when we get to heaven. Now you've heard of Mahatma Gandhi. Talk about someone who is a peaceful protester. Talk about someone who knew how to, how to exercise peaceful protest. It was Mahatma Gandhi. He was the Indian lawyer who was instrumental in leading peaceful protest in the country of India that was able to free India from being governed by Great Britain. And because of his peaceful protest, Great Britain gave India over over to the Indian people to be self-governing. And there you can see the dates of when Mahatma Gandhi lived. But you know, Mahatma Gandhi was a Hindu. But Mahatma Gandhi... Mahatma Gandhi, he, uh, he had a fascination to want to know more about Jesus and the Christian belief. And when he was a young man, still in school, he said in his autobiography that he, he read the gospel seriously, meaning he poured over the gospels. He read about Jesus. He couldn't get enough about Jesus because he hated the Hindu class system. And as he learned about Jesus, he came to the conclusion, Jesus puts an end to the class system. There's no class system among Christians. And so he made his mind up as a young man that he was going to convert from being a Hindu, he was going to become a Christian. And so he made his mind up that the first day he chance he had to go to a Christian church, he was going to go to church, and after the service was over, he was going to ask the pastor, how can I become a Christian? Mahatma Gandhi, in his autobiography, wrote how he went to the Christian church the first time ever when he had made his mind up to become a Christian because he hated the Hindu class system, and he gets to the door, and he's about to come into the sanctuary. There was an usher there who stopped him. And the usher usher said to Mahatma Gandhi, listen, you can't come in here. You will feel more comfortable with your own people down the street. And it's just right down there. And Mahatma Gandhi left. He didn't go in. They wouldn't let him into the Christian church. And he came to the conclusion because of that experience, that that first time that he went to the Christian church, he he decided, wow, I guess I, I was wrong. Christians have a class system too. I might as well remain a Hindu. And he never became a Christian for the rest of his life. This stuff that's going on in the world today, we've got to come to the throne of God more often than we do and find our identity there. It'll humble us and it'll help us be able to accept others 
more easily as well. It'll humble you and it'll help you to be able to accept me more easily as well. There's no class system, no race system or advantage at the throne of God. It starts that way here on planet earth. And in Revelation 5 verse 10 it says, They sang a new song saying, And you have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. You have made us kings and priests. So who exactly are these people serving at the throne in a kingly and a priestly capacity? There are all kinds of people from all over the world. It doesn't specify. It doesn't specify race. It doesn't specify nationality. It doesn't specify gender. It doesn't specify age. But they're serving at the throne of God in a kingly and in a priestly capacity. To serve in a kingly capacity is someone, a king, according to the scripture definition of a king, is someone who ministers to someone else's physical needs. That's not the way that kings on earth look at things. Kings on earth want their subjects to, to, to minister to them. But that's not the way it is with Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords. The king from heaven, kings from heaven, they minister to others. They're more concerned about others' physical needs than they are their own physical needs. They're more concerned about others' physical needs than their own opinions and their own rights. And they're more concerned how they can benefit somebody else's physical needs. Look at the example of Jesus as the King of kings and Lord of lords. He talks about this very point. There was a dispute among them, the disciples, as to which of them was going to be considered the greatest. And Jesus said to them, you know what, the kings of the Gentiles, they exercise lordship over them, and those who exercise the authority over them. But not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as he who serves. Kingly capacity, kingly ministry is to serve someone else and put somebody else's needs above my own. For I am among you as the one who serves. The kingly capacity. So in this COVID-19 environment in which we live, Christians who frequent the throne of God, we should have no issue over being concerned about the physical needs and us laying our opinions, our likes, our tastes and distastes aside in order to minister to the physical needs of someone else today. Serving at the throne of God in the kingly capacity, ministering to the physical needs of others. It's not an issue to fight over who's going to have the power. Who's going to serve? That's the question from heaven, who's going to serve the other. Have you ever heard the story of the legend of the apples? Kind of a silly story, but it, 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 the principle is true. The legend of the apples. Two different apple trees. One's a green tree and one's a red apple tree. And they're looking at all the things going on planet Earth and how human beings are fighting among themselves and can't get along and rioting and all this stuff going wars. And the apples are watching all of this being played out by human beings and one apple says to the other apple, green says to the red, wow, look at, what, look at the mess that the human beings are making of planet Earth. They said if they keep this up, they're going to end up destroying themselves and there won't be any human beings left on planet Earth. And so uh, some of the other apple from the other apple tree says to the green one, said, um, yeah, I said, if that happens, then I guess that will leave us apples in charge. And then we'll be in charge of planet Earth instead of the human beings. And say, yeah, well, that's an interesting thought. Yeah, we would, be, we would be in charge of planet Earth then if human beings killed themselves off. And then one of the apples, no one knows who, but, but one of the apples said, but which color would be in charge? And then the green tree's apples, they all began to say, the green, the green. And then the red tree apples, they all began to say, the red, the red. And the argument was on among the apples, which illustrates the point Christian service, Christian kingship is about service, not lording it over anybody. It's about service, not lording. And the apples ended up falling prey to the very same thing that people today are falling prey with. And it's got to be because 
we as a people on planet Earth are not coming to the throne of God like we're invited to come boldly to the throne of grace. You will find grace to help in times of need. Our world is in a time of need today. We have got to point people to Jesus, the one who's worthy. We've got to point people to the throne of God where they can get the help that they, they need. And, and only then are the social issues around us today and the racial issues around us today, only then is there ever any hope of it being settled. A priestly capacity, they serve as kings and priests. A priest is someone who ministers to the spiritual needs of someone else. Someone who points people to Jesus and puts their hand into the hand of God so that they can get the help that they need. Robert E. Lee, Confederate General of the Southern uh, Forces during the Civil War. When the war was over, did you know Robert E. Lee did not believe in slavery? Read, read about his, his life. He didn't believe in slavery, but he ended up... Uh, had his arm twisted and he had finally agreed to, uh, to lead the Confederate army, but he didn't believe in slavery. When the war was over, he was instrumental in trying to bring about healing between the two sides, the North and the South. And when the Civil War was over, he went to church one day and it happened to be communion. And when he walked into the church and they're ready to serve communion, there was a former slave kneeling at the front of the church, uh, a, a man, Slave, kneeling, freed slave now, kneeling at the front of the church to take communion. And Robert E. Lee, before, he could before the, the slave could receive communion, Robert E. Lee comes up, kneels next to the slave in front of the church, in front of everybody, and shoulder to shoulder with this freed slave, and he accepts communion side by side with this man. When the service was over, someone asked Robert E. Lee, one of his friends asked him, how could you have done that? How could you have gone up and knelt next to him and taken communion side by side with him? And you know what Robert E. Lee said? He said, because at the cross, color does not matter. At the foot of the cross, we are all equal. At the foot of the cross, we are all one. The people, the 24 elders around the throne of God, from all races, all nationalities, all genders, all different. They're the laos, the people of God. They serve in a kingly capacity and in a priestly capacity. If it's that way in heaven, we should start doing it that way here as well. In fact, it's the, it's the heart of the three angels' message. It's the heart of our last day message that goes to the world. Well, it's the everlasting gospel. Yeah, but look what the everlasting gospel, who the everlasting gospel is for. I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth to every guess who it is. Here they, here they are again, the same people that are around the throne of God to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. The same group. Every nation, tribe, fule, tongue, and laos. It's the message for a world divided by racial issues. It's the message for the world divided by nationality issues. It's the message for the world divided by social issues and political differences. The three angels' message for the world today. And so we need to accept the invitation that God gave in Revelation 4, verse 1 to John. When he said, John, come on up higher. Come up higher, John. I got something I want to show you. And he invited John to come into the throne room of God. That's the same invitation that he's giving to our world today as well. Revelation 5 ends with these verses. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands and thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessings. And every creature in heaven and on earth I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Then the twenty-four elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. Revelation chapter 5, the focus is on Jesus. He is the Lamb before the throne of God. So today, some of the things we've seen today, Jesus is our Creator. He's our Savior. He's our Redeemer. He's our Teacher. He's our Uniter. He's our Problem Solver. Today we've seen that we all need encouragement. It doesn't matter how long you've been in the church, what position you have in the church. Even John the Disciple needed it at the throne of God, and so too do we today. We've seen the power of a personal testimony. 
sharing what you have found that has been helpful to you is powerful to encourage someone else. We've seen today that the three angels' message is needed today now more than ever before to every nation, kindred, tribe, tongue, and people. And we've seen today that our identity is founded in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Like it says in Galatians 3, verse 28, There is now, therefore, neither Jew nor Greek. There is now, therefore, neither free nor slave. There is now, therefore, neither male nor female, for we are all one in Jesus, which brings us back to where we started. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? If you have Jesus, along with him comes everything else that you need. Everything else that our world is struggling with today comes with Jesus. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for reminding us of our need to come to you in a new way today, thank you for receiving us, continuing to teach us, preparing us for heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Tony, come share with us one more time. And then, Tony, at the end when you're done, would you mind binding off with prayer? Thank you. This is one that I've played before, Oceans, by Hillsong. bow our heads. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, Lord, we are truly blessed to have the word 
the message that you give to us in our heart in this time, in this day, in this age. Lord, we see such a change in this world and it just like overnight. We can see the forces that are working against the church, the forces that are working against your truth. We see it in the people. We hear it in their voice and fear of the unknown. For those without you must be terrifying, Lord. But with you we have a peace and a comfort, a knowledge and an understanding that we can rise above all of this conflict and all of this despair and have the greatest hope of all. And in the face of it all, Lord, we know that in the end you are a just God and you will bring your righteousness to those of us who are with you, Lord, we praise your name for that righteousness is what we crave and strive to be like. If we are to love you, Lord, we are to keep your commandments, and your commandments are that of love. And we thank you even for the simplest of things, the gift of the breath of life that we have. Each breath, let it be to praise your name. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, everybody, thanks so much again for coming out. Just a reminder that uh, on your way out, there's the offering bucket there in the foyer. And to try to continue to encourage social distancing on your way out, we'll dismiss from the back. So, Bill, yeah, if you would lead us from the, the back, and we'll dismiss from there towards the front. And I hope to see you again uh, next Sabbath. Next Sabbath will be 